God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Lord, we bend the knee of our heart to you, Father God, and we ask you, Lord God, to pour out your spirit upon us. Father, we come to before you, Lord, on bended knee and ask you, Father God, to reveal to us marvelous and wonderful things that we have yet to see. We know, Lord God, that you promise what was and what is, but you also tell us what is to come. And so, Lord God, we come to you with a great zeal and anticipation and a hunger and a desire to hear more of you and what is to come. And we're anxious, Lord God, anxious in a great way to continue to advance the kingdom and build it while we wait, not so patiently, for your return. And so, Lord God, we ask you, Father God, to give us ears to hear and a heart to receive what you would have for us tonight as we study your word to show ourselves approved of you. And we dedicate this time to you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. All right, well, welcome to Igniting a Nation, Revealing Prophecy. The ways to keep in touch with us are through our website, ignitinganation.com. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, LinkedIn. We broadcast our program live from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. daily. The program is called Revealing the Truth. Uh, at, on the Wednesday at 11 o'clock hour is a program called Revealing the Bible. And this program, Revealing Prophecy, will be televised at 10 o'clock every Friday. So you will be the live audience for that, and I hope you'll come out every week and be a part of that live audience as we continue to look at the headlines and what's happening around the world, things that the mainstream media is not reporting on. Uh, we have an Israel trip in 2019. Unfortunately, that's all sold out. However, we do have 21 seats left on our trip for 2020, which includes a Petra option and so we are looking for people to go with us. It sounds like it's far off but I can tell you that these trips creep up on you and all of them sell out a year in advance. So don't think you can wait until January of 2020 and make up your mind because you're going to call me and say, hey we made up our mind and I'm going to say well that's great. So did everybody else. <laughs> so I want to encourage you. We have a table in the back and the table in the back is uh, where you can make a contribution to the ministry. If you're going to make a check, make it to Igniting a Nation. Uh, make sure you put 2019. The bank will not accept a check from 2018. I don't know why. Uh, I guess maybe because it's 2019 now. But uh, we are 100% uh, supported, both our television network and all of our teachings by the contributions of those who watch and those who support the ministry. We do not sell advertising. We do not have sponsors. We are not obligated to any man. Therefore, we are able to cover every topic that a believer contends with and do it without being worried about being politically correct or having somebody pull funding or somebody boycotting us. We own our own network. We own our own broadcast system. We own the fiber that goes out of the building and goes across the world to over 120 nations. And so we broadcast every day, Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. To, uh, to 1 p.m. All of your contributions are tax deductible. And if you'd like to designate to Israel, 100% uh, of all contributions donated to Israel go to Israel. We take no administrative fee from those contributions. Uh, you, many of you haven't heard about the program Revealing the Truth. We have monthly featured guests, maybe names you'll recognize, who are on with us as ministry partners. And they appear on our program once a month. So it's just like you would turn to your regular television program and you'd like a particular show. Well, if you like Joel Richardson, then he's on with us every month. If you like Carl Gallup, he's on with us every month. Dr. Michael Heiser, Dr. Michael Lake, Derek Gilbert, Rabbi Zeb Parat, Dr. Ramona Provasco, Dr. Tim Timothy Jennings, Dr. Mark Baker, Marsha Dunst, Michael Hart from here at the Michael Hart Show, Joan Newby, Rhonda Stoppy, Victoria Jackson, if you remember for her from Saturday Night Live. She's now a uh, uh, crusading believer, a breast cancer survivor, and uh, just a funny, uh, lighthearted view about surviving breast cancer. Uh, Nan Brown Self, who's an expert on forgiveness, and Peter Rosenberger, who is an expert on caregiving. Uh, plus weekly revealing the Bible and prophecy revealed. We're here to talk about revealing prophecy, what was, what is, and what is to come. And this is the week of January 7th. And so what we're going to cover tonight, key points, is a prophecy overview. I'm going to take you on a little journey back to the beginning and the key of prophecy. 
You know, many of you have been around for a long time. You've heard a lot of prophecy teachers that tell you that they have the secrets. They have the insider information. But there's a key that God gave us in the Bible. And that key is in Genesis. And it's where all prophecy begins. And so we're going to take you on a journey all the way back to the beginning so you can see where prophecy was birthed. Everybody's talking about end time prophecy, but that's a misnomer. Because when Messiah comes back, that's beginning time prophecy. That's not the end. The end never comes. I read nothing about an apocalyptic event where the world is wiped out and the zombie apocalypse takes place. All right? There's nothing in the Bible that says this world is going to end. All right? It says that there's going to be a new beginning and it will be the beginning in the Messianic reign. We're going to talk about the genesis of prophecy. We're going to talk about the last day verses. I'm going to shatter some of your uh, paradigms. One of my old paradigms was the anticipation of Psalm 83 war. I have evidence that that has been fulfilled. And as we look at Ezekiel 38 and 39, there's going to be a war. Uh, uh, part of that prophecy talks about a land recovering from war. Most prophecy experts had said it would be the Psalm 83 war that would come before Gog Magog, but I'm going to show you a picture that's going to show you that that may have already been fulfilled and there's going to be another war and one that we're seeing unfold in front of us. We'll take a look at 2018 highlights and we'll take a look at some critical alignments. But let's take a look at prophecy just for a minute from an overview. There's approximately 2,500 prophecies in the Bible. Approximately 2,000 of them have already been fulfilled. So that was the what was and what is, and we're going to talk about what is to come. And we can have some assurance that if they're, given that the Bible proves so reliable a document, there's every reason to expect that the remaining 500 prophecies, those slated for the time of the end, also will be fulfilled to the last letter. Who can afford to ignore these coming events, much less miss out on the immeasurable blessings offered to anyone and everyone who submits to the control of the Bible's author, God himself? Would a reasonable person take lightly God's warning of judgment for those who reject what they know to be true about Jesus and the Bible, or who reject Jesus' claim on their lives? There's a key in the Bible, and that key is a miraculous key, and it's a key that's never talked about in the church. Well, half the key is talked about in the church. How many of you have ever put a key in a lock and turned that key and the key breaks off? All right. Most of us have had that experience one time in our life. How good is half the key? The door's still locked and all you have is half the key. But the very first prophecy in the Bible goes all the way back to Genesis 3.15 where God says, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman in between thy seed and her seed, he shall bruise, crush thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. We know the seed of the woman is Jesus. And we've spent 2,000 years talking about Jesus. And we know that he is the promised seed of the woman, born to a virgin, who was born, lived, died, raised again from the dead, and ascended to heaven and is now sitting at the right hand of the Father. But when was the last time you talked about the seed of the serpent? When was the last time you began to think about the fullness of this prophecy? When was the last time you heard a Sunday message talking about the seed of the serpent? Well, the seed of the woman, we always assumed to be Messiah. But yet in the Bible, there are two references to a woman's seed. One is to Eve. The other is to Hagar. And the prophecy of Hagar's seed goes through the line of who? Ishmael. And so when we begin to see this line of the Antichrist, we begin to see what's taking place right in front of us. We have this wonderful advantage that 1700 years later, we can look back at the birth of Islam and we can see how it's advanced from the 12 provinces and kingdoms that God promised Ishmael. But we can look at the other side of the prophecy against Ishmael, which said that Ishmael would be a wild donkey among men, and all the nations of the world would war against him, and he would be at odds with his brothers. We look at the Sunni-Shiite division. We look at the expansion of 12 nations now being 55 contiguous nations surrounding little Israel. Little Israel surrounded by 55 Muslim nations, yet not one of them can take us out. Why? 
Because there's a promise, and that promise is on Israel. And as we look at end time prophecy, we have to acknowledge that yes, what's going to bring Messiah back will be a war, and he will bring an end to that war, and he will bring salvation to the Jews. But there must rise up one that we read about in Daniel, in the 70 weeks of Daniel, in the 70th week of Daniel. And we have to read about that, and we have to understand who that is. And the Bible gives us that clue in this key in Genesis that is the seed of the serpent. Oddly enough, the only other woman's seed mentioned is Hagar's. So why would God drop that in there if he didn't want us to take a look? Now when we take a look at Ishmael and the role of the Ishmaelites, and we take a look at the alignment of the Edomites, which are the descendants of Esau, who have a bitter hatred towards the Jews, and if you know of the descendants of Lot, Moab, and Ammon, which happens to be Jordan, and you see their participation in the wars, you find that this alignment that's taken place between Ishmael, Esau, and Moab, and Ammon, uh, the descendants of Lot, right, form a coalition. And they form a group whose destruction of the Jews is what they are committed to do for the sole purpose of annihilating us. And people ask, why does everybody want to annihilate the Jews? Well, because through the promised seed of the woman, through the lineage of Abraham to Isaac, the son of the promise to Jacob, was birthed the Jewish nation knowing that that would be the line of Messiah. And so Satan looks at that and says, if I can kill the Jews, then the Messiah is never born. As a matter of fact, we take a look at who the players were in those that try to plan the destruction of the Jews. You had Pharaoh, an Egyptian. You had Haman, an Agagite. Isn't that interesting that he was a descendant of Agag, the, Agag, the one that Saul was told to kill? But yet he spared him and displayed him as a trophy until Samuel took his life. But during that time, he obviously propagated with a woman for Haman to be an Agagite. Then we take a look at who was next in the process. Herod, after the Messiah was born. All right, Herod was an Edomite. He was a descendant of Esau, half of his family. And so we see it play out consistently. Then we hear in Matthew 23, 37 through 39, the proclamation of Jesus about his return. And he says, as he stands at the foot of the Mount of Olives, and he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who stoned the prophets and rejected the ones sent to you. Like a mother hand longs to gather her chicks, how I long to gather you back to me, but you are not willing. Look, your house is left desolate. O Jerusalem, you will not see me again until you cry out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Satan perks up his ears and says, aha, I have another chance. Now I know that if I continue to take out the Jews, then Jesus never comes back. And so when you look at the rise of anti-Semitism, you look at us getting closer. This is one of the end time signs, not laid out in the Bible, but one we understand because of the enmity and the prophecy contained in Genesis. So who does he enlist? A Hitler. An Ahmadinejad, a complete Muslim community of countries where Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East, Europe, all the all the all the cans, Kazakhstan, Afghanistan, all the all the cans are involved. And what's happening? It's coming this way. And as they reproduce at a rate of six to one for every Christian born, there's six Muslims born, they're growing at a rate six times faster than us. Why? Because it's jihad, not through war, but through immigration and emigration, through migration. And as they begin to move into communities, we see that there are tipping points and there are a percentage. And when it becomes 8% of the population, you begin to see Sharia law pop up and Sharia courts pop up. And you begin to see all these things happening. And who is the infidel? Yes, you are the infidel, but the one they're really after is the one that the Quran says that Allah turned into pigs and to monkeys. Right, read for yourself the passages, the surahs, in the Quran that talk about what God thinks or Allah thinks about the Jews. 
And so if you don't think the Antichrist will be an Islamic Antichrist, you've lost sight of the fact of Mecca being the largest gathering of Muslims in the world in Saudi Arabia. Each Muslim male is required to make one pilgrimage in his lifetime to Mecca. When you take a look at the caliphate and who's going to head up the caliphate, right, you see that it's going to be a Muslim that's going to rule. Will it be a moderate? Will it be somebody that can broker a peace agreement and establish the third temple, what we would consider to be the tribulation temple? All these things to bring about the destruction of who? Says God was says, I'll put a hook in their jaw and I will bring them to war against Israel. Only to bring about the return of Messiah, not to annihilate our people. All this hidden right here in this prophecy that you've heard so much about the seed of the woman, but you hear nothing about the seed of the serpent. And we've abandoned this whole process of understanding where this antagonism comes from and where it's being birthed and where it's being fostered. And so when you hear the rhetoric of the imams and you hear them get on television and you watch Middle Eastern TV and you see it in a reliable resource with a reliable Arabic translation, you see them make the declaration that the Jews are monkeys and apes and that we are here to take them out and destroy Israel, that that is still being preached from the pulpits. Hidden right here, the seed of the serpent. And so we have to begin to understand that. We know the prophecies that we've been told about of what to look for that Jesus said to us. Matthew 24, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Now there's a group of preterists out there. People believe that everything was fulfilled in 70 AD except for the return of the Messiah. And they'll post on our page where we have hundreds of thousands of followers and they'll take issue with the fact that we're talking about this kind of prophecy and that we're looking at Ezekiel 38 and 39, that we're examining Psalm 83, we're looking at what's going on in Saudi Arabia, what's going on in Turkey, what's going on in Yemen, what's going on in Pakistan, what's going on in Israel, what's going on in Jordan, what's going on with the Palestinian Authority, what's going on with Fatah and Hamas and Hezbollah and all of that and saying nothing to worry about there. Everything's been fulfilled. Nothing to worry about. You can just sit back and wait and you're going to avoid the coming trouble and don't you worry about it because everything's going to be all right. Well, Bobby McFerrin sang that song. <laughs> don't worry, be happy because everything's going to be all right, man. All right? But that's the gospel of Bobby McFerrin. That's not the gospel of Jesus. And so if people tell you that there's this dual salvation out there, that if you accept Jesus, you'll have eternal life. But wait, there's more. If you accept Jesus today, you're going to avoid the coming trouble. Well, that's a dual salvation theology that's been perpetrated across the mankind doctrinally. And I'll address this right up front. 20% don't believe in a rapture. 20% believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. 20% believe in a mid-tribulation rapture. 20% believe in a post-tribulation rapture. And 20% believe in a pan-tribulation. Everything's going to pan out. <laughs> but when you do the math, what does it tell you? 80% of the people are wrong. The groups are equally split into 20%. So taking a doctrine of the rapture and deciding on which side you're on is really, we'll all find out at the same time, won't we? So what should we be focusing on? We should be focusing on advancing the kingdom. We should focus on being ready. We should be focusing on our neighbor, Muslim, Jewish, the great commission, not the great omission. It says, such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There'll be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. You know, earthquakes are really kind of an interesting phenomena because God uses the things of the natural to reveal supernatural things. And so when the earth contracts, that's a birth pain. Right? And as the contractions come closer and closer together, we know that's when the baby is going to come. And that's how we know when the woman says, yes, they're seven minutes apart, they're five minutes apart, they're three minutes apart, uh, the baby's coming, right? Okay? And what's interesting about that process is the moment that the baby appears, what do they call that? Crowning. 
And this is what we're supposed to look at, is that the outcome of this birth pain, this new birth that we're going to have in Messiah, is a crowning. And so God does use these things, and so when the earth contracts, and we see the increase in earthquakes above 6.0, and we track that, we see that the frequency is increasing, we're looking at these signs. And Jesus tells us, these are the things we're to look at. Then you'll be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you'll be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. I'm here to tell you, this is not your best life now. This is your worst life now. This is the only hell that if you're a believer in Jesus, you will ever know. Your best life is what's to come. And there may be 70 million people out there reading a book called It's Your Best to Live Your Best Life Now, but I'm telling you right now, this is your worst life now. And the worse it gets, the closer it is to the end. And the more excited I get when I hear of wars and rumors of wars, and I hear and I see of these things happening around the world. He continues in Matthew 24, 12, Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. And so as part of the Igniting, Broadca Igniting Nation Broadcasting Network, we're now ministering to 120 home churches in Pakistan. The congregations gathering in India and Israel and Jordan and Lebanon and the Sudan. All throughout the world, bringing the message of the gospel to the world. By igniting the nations for a love of the Lord, by bringing the biblical truth. Our program is headlines, heartlines, and biblical truth. And that's what we're all about. Paul writes in his letter to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, 1, But know this, in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, and from such people turn away. And I will tell you that there are so many churches preaching a prosperity gospel. Let the good times roll. Your best life now. None of that comes from the Bible. That comes from the opinion of man. And the hearts of many are growing cold, and Barna did a survey, and they said that the largest growing number of people who are affiliated with the denomination is the last box on the list, and the box is called none. And none is getting more check marks today than any other denomination. It's the fastest growing denomination of Christianity. No affiliation whatsoever. Why? Because we're hearing half the message. We're hearing about Jesus, but we're not hearing about the seed of the serpent. We're not hearing about the end times. We're not hearing about God's plan from the beginning. From the very beginning in the Garden of Eden, as he laid out the plan of salvation, the plan of redemption, the plan of atonement, the, the first sacrifice that was made and told us what was going to come, that until that prophecy is fulfilled, and that was part of me coming to faith, was because I read my Hebrew Bible all the way through where it ends in Second Chronicles, and that prophecy had yet to be fulfilled. And I ask that question, where in the Old Testament has that prophecy been fulfilled where the seed of the woman crushes the head of the seed of the serpent? And they would shoo me off and say, you just have to keep on doing your research. You go away, go away, go away. Well, I found my answer, but I found it in the New Testament. And so at 44 years of age, I came to faith in Jesus. Paul continues and writes, Now as Janus and Jambus resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapprove concerning the faith, but they will progress no further, for their folly will be manifest to all, as there also was. He continues, But you who have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to be at Antioch, and at Conium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, 
and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Does that not guarantee you that there is going to be trouble? Is that not the tribulation? Is that not the guarantee and promise that you will, by following Jesus, he says to himself, if you follow me, there will be tribulation. He says, for those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, but, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, through faith which is in Christ Jesus. And we believe that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And unless we agree with every word of the Bible and believe that every word of it is true, then it's all a lie. And so if we stand on the word of God, we have to stand on the full counsel of heaven. And look at the entirety of the Bible, including those passages. Dr. Michael Heiser says if it's weird, odd, or unusual, it must be really important. And you need to study it because it's part of that unseen realm. So my question to you was the Psalm 83 war fulfilled. Many of you, how many of you are familiar with the Psalm 83 war? Okay, how many of you have never heard of the Psalm 83 war? Okay. This was a vision given to Asaph. Asaph was uh, part of King David's court. He was, in Hebrew, he was called a choser, a seer. He was not a prophet. But God gave him a vision. And this was the vision he gave him. Psalm 83, do not keep silent, O God, do not hold your peace, and do not be still, O God, for behold, your enemies make a tumult, and those who hate you have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel against your people and consulted together against your sheltered ones. They have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. For they have consulted together with one consent. They form a confederacy against you. And count how many there are. There's ten of them. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gebal, Ammon, and Amalek, Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyre, Assyria also has joined with them. They have helped the children of Lot. Selah, deal with them as with Midian, as with Sisera, as with Jabin at the brook Kishon, who perished at Endor, who became his refuge on the earth. Make their nobles like Oreb and like Zeb, yes, all their princes like Zeba and Zalmunna, who said, let us take for ourselves the pastures of God for a possession. O oh my God, make them like the whirling dust, like the chaff before the wind, as the fire burns the woods and as the flames sets the mountains on fire. So pursue them with your tempest and frighten them with your storm. Fill their faces with shame that they may seek your name, O oh Lord. Well, there's many who read the prophecy of Ezekiel 38 and 39, and there's four requirements of prerequisites for what's going to happen to bring about this alliance, Gog, Magog, Turkey, Russia, Iran. We're familiar with that. We hear a lot about that. But one of the prerequisites is, is that this will happen to a nation recovering from war. And so the scholars got together and said, well, what war could they be recovering from? What war is there? What mysterious happening has not taken place yet? And about 20 years ago, the Psalm 83 war began being discussed. And they began looking at these people group and saying, hey, this hasn't happened yet. This coalition has not yet formed. But yet, it says, let them be confounded and dismayed forever. Yes, let them be put to shame and perish, that they may know that you, whose name alone is the Lord, are the most high over all the earth. I want you to take a look at this map. Count the names in red. How many are there? Ten of them. What's so interesting about these ten names are these are the ten names of those who rose up against Israel in the six-day war and Israel defeated Gebal, Assyria, Tyre, Philistia, Ammon, Moab, Edom, Ishmaelites, Hagarenes, and Amalek. And what's so interesting about this is none of the nations that they dwell in are mentioned in the Ezekiel 38-39 coalition. All of them have been taken out of play. So this circle here shows you that this has been actually fulfilled. And what's so amazing about this in our analysis of this 
and are looking at it through a new lens, and we continue to study this. You see, this is something that five or six years ago, you can go up on our website and download the Psalm 83, te Psalm 83 War Teaching, and it would be something that I was telling you, there's something I was looking forward to coming until I continue to study with the Dr. Michael Heisers and the Dr. Michael Lakes and the Derek Gilberts and the Carl Gallops. And we studied together and we examined and said, but wait, could it be that this circle right here that we're looking at, these are the people groups, the ancient names, they were the ones who were defeated in the Six Day War. So if they're taken out of play and they're not mentioned in the Ezekiel 38, 39, 38 and 39 coalition, then maybe there's more to it. But what's been happening in this past year, and just to give you an overview before I get into, so I don't run out of time because I'm faithful to get you in at seven and out by eight, all right, because we're a one hour TV show. But some of the highlights of 2018, the embassy moved to Jerusalem. As we look at the prophecy given in Zechariah 12, comes under the heading, the Lord will give salvation, the oracle of the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Thus declares the Lord who stretched out the heavens and founded the earth and formed the spirit of man within him. Behold, I am about to make Jerusalem a cup of staggering to all the surrounding peoples. The siege of Jerusalem will also be against, be against Judah. On that day I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all the peoples. All who lift it will surely hurt themselves and all the nations of the earth will gather against it. The recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel also confirms it as the spiritual capital of the world. We look at the mystery of Israel's salvation as Paul wrote in Romans 11. He says, lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. He continues, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you at one time at one, at, were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. At the start of January 2019, Israel's population stood at 8,972,000. This is more than a tenfold increase compared to when Israel was formed in 1948. The Jewish population makes up 6,668,000, or 74.3% of the population of Israel, and 1.878 million Arabs, 20.9%, and those identified as others, non-Arab Christians, Baha'i, etc., make up 4.8%. Yes, they're all considered to be citizens of Israel. These are Israelis. Whether or not they're Jewish, they're Arab, they're Baha'i, there are Arab Christians, there are Arab Muslims, who are citizens of Israel. They have a seat at the Knesset. They have representation. This may be the Jewish state, but it is a democracy. When the state was established, there was only 806,000 residents, and the total population reached its first and second millions in 1949 and 1958, respectfully. Judging by per current population trend data, experts predict that by the, pop the population of Israel reached 10 million by 2024 or sooner. In addition to these numbers, there's approximately 170,000 people living in Israel who are neither citizens nor permanent residents. The overall population grew by 2% in 2018. Out of the 14.5 million Jewish people in the world, 46% now reside in Israel. The Jewish population of Israel now exceeds that of the United States by roughly 1 million. Some 185,000 babies were born, 74.4% Jewish, 22.8% Arabs, and 2.8% others, and 45,000 people died in 2018. Of Israeli Jews, 44.3% self-identify as secular, 11% simply as religious, and 9% as ultra-Orthodox. According to the Israel Democracy Institute, the percentage of ultra-Orthodox is slightly higher. So what does that mean? God is calling the Jewish people back to Israel in unbelief, as was prophesied. 
We are to come back in unbelief. This is why the largest gay, lesbian, pride, gay, LGBT assembly in the world, the greatest parade is held in Tel Aviv every year. And you would say, well, that's an abomination. This is supposed to be a holy nation, a holy people. The Jewish people were called to be set apart. They were the ones to protect the oracles of God. But God said he would return us in unbelief. So that when Messiah came, he would have those to save. And for you, as those who are engrafted into the commonwealth of Israel, not to boast about your salvation, but the gift of salvation was given to you to provoke Israel to envy. People like myself who would come to faith in Messiah and be as zealous as I was as a, as a practicing Jewish person, to be a practicing Jewish believer, as Paul was a practicing Jewish believer. Don't buy into the conversion of Paul, that Paul became something other than Paul. My name was changed at eight days old. God does that to a Jewish child. My name went from Eric Walker to Avraham Mendel Bear Ben Hirsch. Happened upon the eighth day of my life when my name was given to me. Jesus changed people's names. People's names were changed all the time. That doesn't mean he became a different person. He was a Jewish believer and he said, that he went to the synagogue of every city that he visited. He stopped there first, as was his custom. And he referred to himself as a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Benjamite, and continued in the practice and was still Sabbath's observant. And when the Sabbath was over on Saturday evening, where would he meet? He would meet in the homes of the Gentiles, which is where the Gentile church began. You see, Sunday actually begins at sundown on Saturday. And so your worship happens to be on Sunday morning when Sunday really begins at sundown. So when you think about biblical times, the biblical calendar, the biblical timeline, it would make sense that he would go to the synagogue on Friday night and Saturday and go to the home church on Sunday, which began in the evening as was his custom. So when we look at the Bible, we have to look at it in context of the Bible. And so God is calling us back, and so you're going to see an increase in Jewish immigration, right? We see an increase. America in America, if you talk about other races, you're a racist. If you talk about women, women you're a misogynist. If you talk about Muslims, you're an Islamophobe. But if you talk against Jews, that's okay. That's not hate speech. Anti-Semitism stands alone in the media, stands alone in the world as an acceptable form of expression. Why? Because who's the prince of this earth? Satan. And who will continue to turn the world against? Even the church. The church believes they replaced Israel. This is called replacement theology. And that because the Jews rejected Jesus, let me fill you in on a little inside information. In the first 200 years after Jesus, there were more Jewish believers than there were Gentile believers. More Jews believed in Jesus in the first 200 years. Over a million Jewish believers. Yes, there were those that rejected him, but so many accepted him. And today, we're seeing a resurgence. In the last 20 years, more Jews have accepted Jesus than the last 2,000 years combined. And right now, of the 14.7 million Jews in the world, we believe approximately 1 million of them to be Jewish believers. There's a book coming out in February uh, that Carl Gallup and Rabbi Zeb Parat wrote about Rabbi Kadori and his acceptance of the Messiah revealed on the one year anniversary of his death. 300,000 Orthodox Jews gathered at his funeral. This is how impactful a rabbi he was as chief rabbi of Israel. But yet, in his last note, to be opened one year after his death, after his headstone was unveiled, he left a hidden message, and in it, it said, Yehoshua was Messiah. Yeshua, Jesus, was Messiah. It's about to set the world on edge again. There's a chapter in the book in Isaiah 53 that I wrote for the book. And I'm very excited about this project because the world's going to see that modern day 
Orthodox rabbis are beginning to read the hidden texts and the hidden scriptures and come to faith in Messiah. Troop withdrawal from Syria was announced. On the surface, the announcement was 2,000 troops to be withdrawn, the same troops that were used uh, in Iraq to fight ISIS, as was the promise that they were going to move those troops from Iraq and move them into Syria to follow ISIS until they wipe them out. But beneath the surface, the U.S. support of Israel is unconditional, and this move removes American troops from involvement in the Assad regime. John Bolton just left a meeting where he went and talked to Erdogan and before Parliament and said, if you will agree to keep the Syrians from attacking the Kurds, we will pull out of Syria. Okay? This is a move which is a very strategic move. And it's not because we're leaving the Middle East. It's because there's something else associated with it. As we look at the bigger picture in Saudi Arabia, we have the Khashoggi response. All right, here this journalist was killed and everybody was an outcry in the media. Why wasn't America sanctioning Saudi Arabia? Why wasn't there an action taken against Saudi Arabia? Saudi's support for the Iran with, with, uh, deal withdrawal, uh, was they were the first ones to speak out and support America for pulling out of the Iran deal. Now there's new diplomatic relationships between Israel and Saudi Arabia. This was prophesied in the Ezekiel 38-39 war that Saudi Arabia would condemn the actions of Iran and this alliance that was forming. Saudi Arabia is an ally of America and an ally of Israel. And in the last day war and the campaign of Armageddon, they will be a vocal opponent to the attack on Israel. And so America, with this 100 evangelical Christian leaders speaking into the ears of Donald Trump, are telling him, listen, do not cut off ties, do not take severe action because of this Khashoggi incident. Because this is an ally that in the end time prophecies we are going to want to be aligned with for the protection of Israel. Shiite, Shiite Iran and Sunni Saudi Arabia have a historic rivalry in the Middle East. Saudi Arabia has repeatedly called on Iran to stop its meddling in the affairs of the kingdom's neighbor. And Saudi Arabia is opposed to the Ezekiel 38 war. This is important from a biblical perspective, from a prophetic perspective, to look at the headlines through a biblical lens and take a look at the full word of God and say, how is this impactful? This is the first president we've had that's had an evangelical council. I've had Dr. Robert Jeffries on the program three or four times who has a regular audience to talk about prophecy with Donald Trump and explain to him what these prophetic countries, these prophetic nations are all about. Iraq had their first democratic elections and a moderate Shiite was elected and formed a coalition government that was made up of both Shiite and Sunni representatives. This coalition is building stronger ties with the United States. The Iraqi alliance will create a buffer between Iran and Israel. It's unannounced but yet confirmed that the U.S. military is constructing a new base in western Iraq near the Syrian border. This was reported by a Kurdish official that they're reportedly building a new base in Iraq's western province of Anbar as part of attempts to perpetuate its occupation of the conflict-ridden Arab country indefinitely, regardless of all opposition from religious figures and people from all walks of life. Well, imagine if we establish a base on the border, on the western border of Iraq, right there on the border of Syria, right there at the intersection of the border of Israel, as a buffer to anything that can be intercepted coming in from Iran, all of a sudden you find out America is strategically positioned to defend Israel by taking this position by creating an alliance with Iraq. These are not things the mainstream media is telling you. Iraq has been in a declaration of war against Israel for the last 50 years, yet last month, for the first time in 50 years, Three delegations of Iraqis visited Israel. They went to Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum. They went to the Israel Museum, and they met with leaders in an unofficial capacity. An Iraqi passport is not honored in Israel. An Israeli passport is not honored in Iraq. And yet there's great protests coming out of the Iraqi government, out of the Shiite side, looking for an investigation to who these three 
um, delegations were and what they were doing. Well, they were talking about a peace accord. They were talking about a coalition using an American base in western Iraq to be an alliance to protect Israel from Iran and to join Israel in an attack on Iran, which is pending. And so if you take a look at this proxy Hezbollah out of Lebanon, and you see that these tunnels were demolished out of Hezbollah, coming out of Lebanon into Israel. You see that there is a lot of funding of this $150 billion that the Muslim president of the United States gave to Iran is being used to funnel against <laughs> activities against Israel. Look at America, we finally cut off support for the Palestinians, finally, in this administration. But there's a new alliance forming. Iran, Russia, Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, and Israel. There's more alignment towards Ezekiel 38 and 39. Hezbollah and Iran proxy is tunnels destroyed on the Lebanese border. Russia is entrenched in Syria, Libya, Ethiopia, and the Sudan, both in nuclear and military presence under the guise of bringing electricity to Ethiopia and Sudan and Libya. But yet they're bringing missiles, billions with a B, billions of dollars of missiles into Sudan, Libya, and Ethiopia. These are the nations mentioned in Ezekiel 38 and 39 in this alliance with the Gog of Magog. Turkey is attemp attempting through Erdogan to reestablish the Ottoman Empire. All of this end time prophetic. And so when we look at the Ezekiel 38 prophecy, I want to point out several things to you that you may or may not have heard. Because there are prerequisites in this that must happen before this happens. So everyone who tells you that we're on the brink, that this, could, this war could break out any moment, that we're on the verge of an alliance being formed because Russia is meddling in the affairs of Iran, and they're involved in the affairs of Turkey, and they're involved in the affairs of Libya, and all these nations are mentioned in this alliance, there are four specific prerequisites, and we're going to talk to those, but let me read this to you. This is from Ezekiel 38, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against, prophesy against him and say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against you, O God, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. And I will turn you about and put hooks in your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords. And look at the countries. Persia. In our lifetime, Persia's name changed. For many of you, you remember. The first Shah of Iran was a Nazi sympathizer. The word Iran in Arabic means Aryan, and therefore the first Shah was sympathetic to the agenda of ethnic cleansing, and therefore Iran means Aryan, just like the Aryan nation of Nazi Germany. And so God looks at it as Persia, which his name was until 1937. Persia, Cush and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer, which we believe to be Germany, and if you take a look at the Islamization of Germany and the fall of Angela Merkel, and you see the collapse of Western Europe, all of a sudden you begin to realize that some of these signs are taking place and we're seeing all this being forming, this is setting the stage and all his hordes. Beth Torgama from the uttermost parts of the north with all his hordes, many peoples are with you. Now when you talk about the uttermost parts of the north, you have to begin starting out heading north from Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the rose of the compass of the Bible. And so when you go due north, the first major country you have to pass through is Turkey. And the first major city due north of Jerusalem is Ankara. And from Ankara, if you go due north to the uttermost north, you go directly to Moscow. But you have to go through Turkey first in order to get there. This is the prophecy. Be ready and keep ready, you and all your hosts that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be mustered. In the latter years, you will go against the land that is restored from war. First condition. Israel must be restored from war. 
is there a war going on in Israel right now? The answer is no. So there has to be a war before this war and there has to be a restoration of Israel because this says that that is a prerequisite. It says in the latter days you will go against the land that is restored from war. The land whose people were gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel which have been a continual waste. And so we know that God is gathering the Jews back. He's telling us to flee to the hills when we look at the prophecies to flee to the hills because when the armies of the Antichrist come and overrun Jerusalem, we will be fled to the hills. We will not be there. When Jesus returns, he's coming to redeem the tents of Jerusalem first. We don't live in tents. So where will we be living in tents? And so you have to examine the text and the clear meaning of the text and examine that. Then he says, its people were brought out from the peoples and now dwell securely, all of them. Would you assess today that Israel is a secure nation living securely with its neighbors? No. You have rockets being launched from Gaza every single day. You have tunnels coming in from Lebanon. You have the battle over the Golan Heights and people fighting over turf wars. You have Fatah, Hezbollah, Hamas. You have uh, al-Nusra, you have Boko Haram, you have ISIS, the Taliban, you got al-Qaeda. The names go on and on that are coming against Israel. But this is a prerequisite that they now dwell securely. He says, you will advance coming on them like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your hordes, and many peoples with you. Thus says the Lord God, on that day thoughts will come into your mind, and you will devise an evil scheme and say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. Now, I've been to Israel 16 times. And when you go into Judea and Samaria, you go into walled villages. So there's still walled villages. He says, I will fall upon the quiet people who dwell securely, all of them dwelling without walls and having no bars or gates. Well, you've got to go through Checkpoint Charlie you, in order to pass through the West Bank. You have to stop at a security gate. You have to exit through a security gate. All right, there's gates which are locked up in Jerusalem. There's the passing at Gaza, which is a border. This doesn't exist today. And therefore, this is a prerequisite. This is what God is saying, that you're going to go up again to the land of unwalled villages. I will fall upon the quiet people who dwell securely, all of them dwelling without walls and having no bars or gates. Well, that's not the Israel of today. That means this war is not imminent. Something has to happen before this happened. For those of you that hear or look on television and say, it's just around the corner, it can happen every day. It's one trigger pull from Iran, and the war is going to start, and Ezekiel 38 and 39 will be upon us. This tells you that there are prerequisites, and they have yet to be met. He says, to steal spoil and carry off plunder, to turn your hand against the waste places that are now inhabited and people who are gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods, who dwell at the center of the earth, Sheba and Dadan and the merchants of Tarshish and all its leaders will say to you, have you come to seize spoil? Now listen to this. Have you assembled your host to carry off plunder, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods to seize great spoil? Israel has no silver and no gold mines. And for years we could not understand this reference to silver and gold until oil was discovered and the largest oil deposit in what do we call oil? Black gold. And then they found the largest natural gas deposit off the coast of Haifa. How many of you, how many of you know what you transport natural gas in? Stainless steel pipe. What color is stainless steel? Silver. silver. All of a sudden we have an understanding of what silver and gold is. And yes, Israel is now rich with silver and gold because the new pipelines which are extending and new uh, relationships are being established for Israel to provide for natural gas and for oil to nations which would have risen up against them in the past, but no longer will they rise against them. Therefore, son of God, prophesy and say to God, thus says the Lord God, on that day when my people Israel are dwelling securely, will you not know it? 
Israel is not secure today and will not be secure until they recover from a war. And that war that they are on the brink of is a war, maybe the fourth Gaza war, maybe another intifada, maybe a proxy war with Hezbollah out of Lebanon, we don't know. But Israel will be victorious and they will be living in peace with their neighbors. Why? Because they will conquer it and have expanded. He says, you will come from your place out of the othermost parts of the north, you and many peoples with you and all of them riding on horses, a great host, a mighty army. You will come up against my people Israel like a cloud covering the land. In the latter days I will bring you against my land that the nations may know me when through you, O Gog, I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. This is what's happening in the world around us. This is what's going on today in the prophetic landscape of our times. And this is what we will do each Tuesday night here, is we'll take the events, and just today, I have a list longer than I can cover next Tuesday from just the events of today. Each week this will be contemporary, it will be what happened in the previous week as we begin to look at the landscape and the prophetic landscape and the moves and to understand why certain decisions are being made that the media is not telling you about, why information is not being shared to you and through you from Middle Eastern resources, why we have to go to the sources that I have and the experts that I go to, to assemble this information to share it with you and tie it back to Scripture. This is not doctrine, this is not Judaism, this is not Torah, this is the biblical scriptures, the prophecies of the Bible, how they're unfolding, how they're aligning, and why things are unfolding the way they are, and who the players are so you'll know them by name. So when you open your Bible and you look at Revelation, and you begin to examine the people, have yourself a biblical atlas. Take a look at that last book of the Bible you've never read the book of maps. And take a look at that and find out what those places are. All right? And that's what we're going to do each week. Does that excite you? Yes. Is this information you've heard before? All right? This is information that I'm going to bring to you on a weekly basis on Tuesday night. Let me tell you what's on the back table before I send you out with a blessing. We've done a few minutes left. Both my books are there. Also registration forms for the Israel trip. There's also offering bags back there. And we ask you for a love offering to give out of the goodness and the generosity of your heart to support this ministry. If you just want to write the letters I-A-N on your check, that's fine. We also take credit cards, cash stocks, bonds, uh, organ donations, uh, kidney transplants, uh, real estate deeds, automobile titles, uh, livestock, we're very fond of livestock, um, gold jewelry, uh, silver if we have to, uh, but we do appreciate your support. Let me have you stand to your feet and send you out with a blessing. In Numbers chapter 6 and verse 22, the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons, this is how I want you to bless the children of Israel. He goes on to say in this way, I will put my name on them and I will bless them. Please bow your heads to receive the Aaronic benediction. Yivarechach Adonai v'yesmrecha, Ya'er Adonai panavaleka v'kunecha, Yisar Adonai panavaleka v'yesimlecha shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his countenance toward you and give you his peace. In the name of the Prince of Peace, Jesus our Messiah. Amen and Amen. You are dismissed. Shalom. <laughs>